Welcome to your essential business briefing. Coming up, can economic growth be greener? We look at how investing in environmental policies could boost countries' development. More than a decade on from the start of the crisis, why are Europe's banks still struggling with so many bad loans? And we find out how French shopping centres are trying to reinvent themselves for the age of online retail. First up though, do we need a new approach to economic success? We've had a string of warnings in recent months about the slowdown in the global economy. More inclusive growth is one of the subjects that political leaders and other attendees at the Paris Peace Forum have been talking about. One of the ideas, investing more in green technology and renewable energy. So how can we grow our economies in a different and more environmentally conscious way? That's one of the goals of the Global Green Growth Institute, an international organisation based in South Korea. Frank Reismerman is its Director General and he joins me now in studio. Frank, thanks very much for coming in to see us. Can you give us an idea, when we talk about green growth, what does that exactly mean? Well, as you already started, it is economic growth that is also sustainable, dealing with the climate challenges and the many other environmental issues we have, and inclusive, bringing everybody along. And when you start on this journey to try it towards green growth, can you give us an example of the sort of policies or the sort of steps the countries are making to be greener in growing their economy? Well, we used to start working on national green growth plans, but since we have a Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, really what it means is planning for countries to achieve their nationally determined contributions on the Paris Agreement and helping them achieve their Sustainable Development Goals. And that then can lead to having a national energy efficiency plan or a plan for becoming 100% renewable energy or in Nepal we help them come up with an e-mobility, electric mobility plan for instance. And next it is how to implement those plans through projects and investments. And it, when you go to help a country or go to work on a country's uh, project, are you just drawing up a plan or how far do you go with the implementing the plan? Well, we actually sit inside government, so we don't make our plan and give it to government, we help make plans for the government. So the Green Growth Plan is finished when the Cabinet adopts it, and we then help government formulate their projects and raise money for them. So if you like, it's not our plan that we give to the government, but we sit inside government, we're embedded in government, in ministries of finance or planning or environment. So if you like, we're really helping them achieve their own goals. And where does the money come from for projects like renewable energy? Well, the interesting thing is that renewable energy has become commercially attractive. So, uh, yes, a lot of developing countries think they need development aid, but we can help them develop projects where the private sector will come directly to the table and in some cases invest everything. In other cases, we come up with projects where the Green Climate Fund puts in some money, the AFD can put in some money, and then the private sector will come on board. So these are public agencies that can help contribute. Uh, and is that uh, that's only in developing countries? Yes, in least developed countries there's a lot more developing uh, development money available. If we work in countries like Qatar or the UAE where we work also, then they will have the money themselves. So there it's more coming up with ideas, showing that this can work in countries that are completely focused on fossil fuels, but beginning to realize that there has to be a future in their sort of post-hydrocarbon future where they also need to diversify and get into different plans. But yes, in those countries, there is enough money to uh, fund their own projects. And I'm intrigued because those are countries, of course, that we know because of their oil and gas reserves. Mm -hmm. How serious are they about greener energy and moving away from what is essentially the biggest element of their economy? Well, the UAE is also one of the largest investors in solar energy. And of course, they have lots of space and lots of sunlight. So they were one of the first to achieve really low prices for solar energy, like less than two cents, which demonstrated to the world that actually solar energy is the cheapest form of energy around. Qatar is very serious in organizing the greenest World Cup next year, so they will make sure they offset all the emissions that come from that, and we work with them to also make it a zero plastic and hopefully zero waste cup as well. So I think we, we see a lot of real interest in turning their economies around. Of course, countries in that part of the world are also the ones most affected by climate change. Kuwait, I think, is the hottest city on Earth, and growing hotter every year, uh, and they're affected by water shortage as well, which will only get worse. 
to, so this isn't a case of greenwashing of some of these countries get accused of, of tokenism towards green policies. You do see serious interest from authorities there. That's the interesting thing. I've been into sustainable development all my career for 40 years, and most of the time, ministries of finance, ministries of planning weren't really interested. But now, you know, I live in Korea, which is a shining example of rapid economic growth, but we're dealing with the impacts of air pollution every day. So real people, ordinary people have to wear masks, companies become really concerned, and ministers of finance realize that it's in their best interest to actually invest straight off into a form of economic growth, still economic growth, but that is green. Is this an, an optimistic way to see countries tackle climate change in their own backyard? Is this the way that we should be driving countries to act in a positive way for the environment? There's no other way. The International Energy Agency brought out their World uh, Energy Outlook, and it shows that we're not on track to reach the Paris Agreement. But on the other hand, that there is enough technology, there is enough in terms of solutions to drive this forward in a more positive way. But then in the first place, it will require a lot of political will. In the second place, a lot of money. So that's where the private sector will have to come in. These concessional finance sources, this development money might put billions on the table. But in the end, we'll have to get the private investors, the pension funds, the companies that have the trillions in assets off the sidelines and investing in our own sustainable future. And are you confident that you can do that? Yes, I think uh, we see a lot of positive signs that, frankly, because we see the impact of climate change, so the hot uh, summer, the heat waves we had in the summer led the UK Parliament to adopt a climate crisis perspective and have a climate, uh, if you like, law that will make the country carbon neutral by 2050. France, same thing. Europe is very close to that. So I think it is because the urgency is so clear now that we also see an increasing political will to take action. Not fast enough, of course, that's the whole debate. How can we accelerate climate action? Because we do need it urgently, we need it now. Okay, Frank Reismaroon from the Global Green Growth Institute, thank you very much for speaking to us. Now, it's been a difficult time for many of Europe's biggest banks. In the most recent earnings season, the likes of Deutsche Bank and Société Générale saw slumps in profits in the third quarter. The record low interest rates set by the European Central Bank are hurting these banks, earning potential. But it's not the only challenge that they're facing. Many banks are still struggling with huge amounts of bad debt, a legacy of the last economic crisis. Kate Moody has been looking into this. Kate. Well, Stephen, bad debts are otherwise known as non-performing loans. It's when the borrower goes 90 days without paying an instalment or interest. For banks, that means setting aside their own capital to cover the cost and it reduces their profitability. That tends to make future loans to other consumers more expensive. According to data from the European Banking Authority, the overall amount of bad debt at EU banks has fallen to its lowest level since the financial crisis, 636 billion euros in the month of June, or around 3% of all current loans. But there are warning signs in some member states. Banks in Greece are at the highest risk, with over 39% of their loans described as non-performing. Cyprus is a close second at 21.5%, while Portugal and Italy come in just under 9 and 8%, respectively. To put those numbers in perspective, 2.6% of French loans are deemed bad, and 1.3% in German banks. Sweden's sector is currently the strongest. Well, governments are trying to tackle the problem. Athens, for example, is pushing a scheme dubbed Hercules. It's modelled on a programme that's already underway in Italy. It allows banks to sell off some of their debt to fund managers or other buyers, with a slice of it guaranteed by the government. If successful, Hercules could wipe some 30 billion euros worth of non-performing loans off of the balance sheets of Greek banks. Well, the EU says that the Greek and Italian plans do not constitute state aid and are legal. But the bloc has strict rules which can make it difficult for banks to sell off or get rid of non-performing loans. Regulators at the Banking Authority are hoping to make the process easier, allowing lenders more flexibility for a rainy day. Stephen? Kate, thank you very much for that. Now, back here in France, retailers are gearing up for their busiest period of the year. But many consumers, as in years past, won't be visiting physical shops, instead choosing to buy online. That change has hit shopping centres hard. In France, one in ten units are standing empty. Reviving these malls has become a new challenge, as Delano D'Souza now reports. 
Storefront shuttered and display windows left empty. Out of the 60 shops at this mall near Paris, nearly half are closed, driving existing customers away. It's closed, it's ugly. The shops are less attractive, no interest. With shoppers deserting the mall, shop managers are worried about what lies ahead. We are in trouble, and our turnover continues to decrease. We're really feeling the pain, and the morale is bad too. It's a familiar story being played out across France's shopping centres over the past few years. An average of one in ten stores are closed at any given mall in the country. That's led to a 19% decrease in the number of shoppers over the past five years. But this wasn't always the case. Back in the 1980s, shopping at a mall was seen as a sign of success and affluence. It's young, modern, I love it. To avoid going under, shopping centres are trying to reinvent themselves. This mall in Montpellier lost 25% of its revenue over the past decade and it's now getting a makeover worth 50 million euros. We're in the middle of breaking everything because the idea of a shopping centre initially was to be centred around itself and to turn its back on the city in a way. Today we're literally opening up the mall. Natural light with a glass roof, more plants and a completely redesigned layout. This director wants to limit the number of clothing stores as well. Today, with competition from the Internet, it's a sector that's hurting. So we are reducing clothing options. We increase services, restaurants and leisure activities. While a new generation of shopping centres are being built across France, results from the first eight months of the year show revenues have started to rise. Well, that's it from us for this week. But you can always find the best of our business coverage on our website and on our Facebook page. And you can tweet me with your comments at Newstephen. Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Gulliver Craig, France 24's correspondent in Kiev. I'm forever crisscrossing Ukraine, Poland and other countries in the region to keep you up to date with all the news from Central and Eastern Europe. Join me on Live from Paris and in all France 24's news and magazine programmes. Gulliver Craig, one of the 200 France 24 correspondents around the world.